introduce the folks uh, sitting up here next to me. Um, to my right uh, is uh, Elisa Fedorov, um, who is, if I get your title right, is it um, production and distribution head? Yes. Or what's? Distribution. Just distribution. Yep. Distribution head at, at Neon, who I guess doesn't really need any introduction. Um, they had the Palm d'Or winner last year, uh, Anatomy of a Fall, um, uh, Robot Dreams, which was Oscar nominated, uh, La Chimera, which is one of the high my highlights of Cannes last year, which is still in release in the US, yeah. Um, one of, if not the best art house distributor uh, uh, in the US. Um, to my immediate left uh, is Josh Rosenbaum, um, who is uh, with, uh, are you a partner at Waypoint? Partner, partner. Waypoint uh, Entertainment. Um, Waypoint, I mean, the favorite, uh, nice guys. Uh, any other project you wanna pitch that uh, Waypoint's, you know? Proud of, particularly proud of. Mid nineties in the upcoming Cuckoo Whitney. Oh right, of course, yeah. Cuckoo, Cuckoo, who is in Berlin, um, yeah. uh, which uh, these guys cooperate on. We'll talk about that later. Um, and to the far uh, left is Nick Shoemaker, um, and is it correct? Head of AC Indie, is that the right at Anonymous? It's yeah, that's yep. good. And um, yeah, Anonymous. I mean, also, uh, you know, whatever. What's what's what are your two or three uh, favorite films that you like to mention? You've done so much. Architon, which was in Berlin, is it was uh, I really loved. But I mean, maybe you have one or two favorite uh, Anonymous projects you want to pitch. We've got some coming up that are pretty exciting. Okay. All right. Well, we can get into that. Um, well, first, maybe for all of you, but maybe a bit on the sort of equity side first before we talk more about distribution. Um, I was looking at some study that said private equity investment in, in film in the US last year was like at a six year low. I mean, equity has been usually much easier available for indie film in the US than over here in Europe. Um, it seems to be in a bit of a, a, a valley what is the reason for that? And is it a temporary thing? Do you expect equity to come back? Or is there some structural change that is making, invest uh, making investors uh, more hesitant to, to move into the film? From my side of things, I think it's a result of the pandemic. Um, everything looked like it was shifting to streaming, so it felt like private equity's place in independent financing was really stuttered, I think. But I do think it's cyclical, and now that the foreign markets are rebounding a bit more, um, hopefully we'll be seeing more partners to finance movies with. I think from, from our perspective, I mean, at Waypoint, we were maybe writing some of the largest equity checks in the business, you know, in 2016, you know, films like Hostels that are, you know, over $40 million, and we were doing that with no U.S. distribution in place. So, um, you know, when the sales market collapsed, I think a little bit um, around then, it just made equity film financing, financing untenable. And when, you know, places like the streamers like Netflix were at one point seeming to buy almost any film that was released at a large festival in the United States uh, to zero, uh, it left a lot of equity financiers with a lot of money out and a lot of our colleagues in that space are no longer investing in films. We made the decision to just focus on development um, and uh, you know, set up projects like other producers, but we were a, a development financing space. But that's kind of like led to our experience of, of working with Neon, who financed one of our, our indie films, and which led to us having such a good experience with them that we decided to, to partner up with them to finance again. But you know, really doing it in partnership with a, with a distributor. Because it's, it's, it's a scary place for equity right now. <laughs> yeah, and is it going to stay scary? I mean, you talk about things looking like it's coming back. Obviously, the pandemic is over. The market is starting to recover in some ways. Um, is it just a lag for equity to come back into film? Or is something structurally changed that makes it scarier for equity investors or harder for them to get in? And that we'll have to adjust to that as the new normal. I mean, I think on a balance sheet perspective, the people who want to invest equity in film kind of know the risk profile of it. Um, the films that we're introducing to market, you know, right now, the pre-sales we're getting are, you know, all above take, if not close to ask. So I think it's like always just being as, you know, diligent as possible to, you know, the risk exposure that you want to take. But I think looking at certain um, 
territories and independent distributors really coming back up and seeing good box office numbers. It just recreates a negative that, well, this is a risky endeavor. You know, it's an endeavor that, you know, with a little bit of luck and, you know, a little bit of analysis can sometimes pay off. I think it's, I think it's changed just which packages you can get made right now. So for films that are maybe a little more domestic skewing in the U.S. that you can't rely on the foreign sales value, those are becoming very difficult. And that's like projects that, you know, we have, that we're talking about right now. I don't think if we just took them out to get financed via, uh, you know, international sales, they wouldn't be possible. Like we have to make that decision with a Neon, with an H24, like we know one of these smaller studios or it just can't happen. Yeah, well, maybe um, because you sort of referenced it, uh, Neon and Waypoint did a, um, I guess you'd call it a slate deal uh, with to um, uh, produce and distribute uh, a package of a sort of budget, what's around $10 million? 10 to 20 is 10 to our $10 range dollar, right now. Uh, productions. Um, can you tell me a bit about that? What is the um, interest in Neon in collaborating with Waypoint on that? And, and why, uh, why now? What is, what is the sort of um, solution that uh, this uh, arrangement solves? Uh, what, what problem does it solve uh, in the current market? <clears throat> Yeah, well, I think it's important to back up a little bit, maybe, and talk about the U.S. independent... Sorry, there's like a lag. <laughs> um, the independent space right now. You know, we've obviously seen a lot of changes since COVID. So we had COVID, we had the strike, we had the influence of streamers making... Uh, a big impact on the independent space and the overall U.S. marketplace. We saw a lot of consolidation. There are far fewer titles in the marketplace now. There are far fewer titles um, on every date. And because we are such an ecosystem all working together for audiences to come out, for independents and studios and exhibitors to all work together to really bring audiences back in a habitual way, it's really important um, and it's really interesting because we've seen box office coming down, but we've seen the specialty space rebound and for companies like Neon, A24, um, IFC, all of the people who are in the space now that have, were in the space before, our box office has actually increased and that, in my opinion, is because we are filling in a gap that has disappeared from studio consolidation. And for us to fill this gap, we want more high profile projects. We want to be in the production space. We want to be in the financing and development space so that we can make our dollar go further and we can make more impactful projects. And working with Waypoint is a great example of a way we can do that. Now we can flex in that space more. We have more money to go after projects that previously maybe we couldn't go after. Um, it makes us a bigger player, and that's really important in a, in a time where, you know, some of the studios are consolidating or only putting out and investing in really large tentpole films and fewer of them so that there are fewer films in the marketplace overall. And um, the, uh, you mentioned uh, the impact post-COVID and the box office coming back, but has there been a change in, I don't know, audience demographic? Because um, at least the numbers I've seen suggest that the, what used to be considered the ideal art house audience, which was post 40, post 50, my people, um, that, uh, that that audience hasn't really come back, suggesting that the art house audience that you're going for now is actually much younger. How does that impact what projects you want to do and, and, and how you go out into the market to get them? Yeah, so like everybody who got caught up in a different behavior during COVID, uh, you know, older, the plus 40, plus 50, plus 60 audiences, I think, found streaming for the first time. And which is something that, you know, we're all familiar with. And instead of going to the cinema every single weekend, they're becoming more discerning. So they absolutely still come out to theaters. That's not really a problem anymore. The, you know, I think the risk averse population has, <clears throat> that's dissipated. And so now they're coming out for, for projects that they really love, for films that are really special. And the art house audience that we're finding that Neon really connects with is a younger audience. And that audience is really robust. They're really interested in film. They are interested in um, going back to the archives and finding film that they had previously only 
pirated before that never existed in a cinema. And those, uh, those folks are coming out for repertory and, and other older projects. <clears throat> So this film that we're doing with Waypoint, which is a genre film, Cuckoo, which is wonderful, it'll be hitting the uh, US cinemas in August. Um, genre, for example, is in horror and thrillers. Th these are films that are really connecting with this younger audience and really connecting with audiences in general in the US and really over-indexing right now. So that's something that we've found a lot of success with. And, and for Waypoint, the appeal of look, hooking up with Neo, I, Neon, is that uh, what? That you, you can guarantee the, the domestic release? That you don't have to chase around trying to get a P-sale? Or what's, what's the real appeal of, of boarding with a distributor like Neon for, um, for an equity guy like you guys? I mean, there's, there's so many uh, benefits, uh, frankly, because this, uh, this slight deal initiated from a deep sense of selfishness of, because of just how difficult it is to get certain types of films um, really in that five to twenty five million dollar range like there's just not a lot of options right now and a lot uh, there's a lot of fear in the US I think of, of taking chances on bold films um, with diverse and interesting casts and so there's I don't know five options on some projects and some there's two so you know, if we're already in a, a feeling of we have the monetary ability to go and finance our films, but we see the risk issue, like it's it's just imperative to have your distribution partner in place. You guys can talk about the models together, and so it's a it's selfishly for our own development production slate for the films that we're originating. This is just a way for us to actually get those made, and just for our peers in this space, it's it's actually a willing and excited partner to be green lighting films because there's just not a lot of options right now. So I mean, like, Neon is gonna continue doing films without us. They have the robust capabilities, but we can then be more bullish and go after, like I wanna be targeting the films that the studios used to make. You know, I want, I've been like telling the representatives, like I want you to send us the projects that you would have sent to Paramount, Warner Brothers, New Line, like that's what we want. We want, because everything that we do together, we're always trying to make it a theatrical release, like a big US theatrical release. Um, we've shot all of our films on film, except for two that Netflix mandated that we shoot not on film. So, you know, I think we just have, we're very aligned, it just creatively, now financially. So, the list goes on. <laughs> so, because Nikki mentioned um, and uh, about pre-sales uh, or the sale market here seeming quite robust. Uh, that's what I've heard for a lot of people. There's an enormous number of pre-sale packages on, on this market. Um, how does that square with what Nick's saying about how, oh, Nick's saying, what Josh's saying about how uh, difficult it is to get certain projects uh, financed? Is it, we're talking about quite different types of projects? What, what things are working on the old school sort of pre-sale market at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that there are a number of different factors that are making it difficult. You know, interest rates are higher, lack of distribution companies domestically, when the domestic number for English language films was what a lot of finance plans were predicated on. Um, so it's really trying to hit your target budget if you don't have the U.S. partner locked in early. And, you know, it, it may not be as much waiting until selling domestic off a of finished film in the hopes that you're going to, you know, double or triple what you know, what your expectation was. Uh, I did want to add one thing in terms of the younger audience, uh, which we experienced because we, for the first time, started investing a little bit in uh, distribution in the UK with Altitude and with um, uh, Elysian. And it was mind boggling to watch the box office numbers on Boy and the Heron, you know, where we modeled it out at, I think, six times less of what the ultimate was. And I'd have to think G-Kids did you know, something similar to it. And I think, you know, the attention Ghibli specifically and in terms of older cinema that we can reprogram into theaters now is getting as largely one, it's one of the best catalogs of animation, you know, I think in the world. But two, Netflix and HBO introduced it to a whole new audience. So you're talking about three and four generations, or let's say three at least, um, you know, discovering this animation. and. You know, I think that's going to propel the international animation se sector in a really interesting way in the next couple of years. So, and uh, I mean, the question I asked though before on the idea of certain type of projects working for the pre-sale market and uh, others that maybe can't, because I mean, I see that's what you're you're saying, Justin. A lot of the stuff that you want to do 
is harder to do in the traditional pre-sale model, but it seems like a lot of people are still, or even jumping back into pre-sales. I, I think that the, the toughest area is just the straight equity investments in the US. If somebody, you know, when I was at UTA, if somebody were to come up to me and say, can you go raise $7 million and let's see what happens, that's not happening as much. You know, it is occasionally. You know, it's not something that we would ever do. Um, and I think a lot of those smaller independents don't necessarily travel, and they travel less, you know, outside of the U.S. So you just have to be super selective about what you think can work and really trust your partners, you know, on the international side, you know, in terms of positioning the films. And I think it's also, it's, it's a finite list of, of actors and actresses that will generate significant revenue. Um, and it's, it's not, I don't know, it would be egregious to say a boring list, but it's not exactly the most imaginative at times. Um, and especially if you're looking to break new actors. Um, and so I think that, that that definitely is working against us. Uh, and uh, did the cost of shooting in the United States and the budgets associated with US-centered stories, I mean, I haven't shot in the States in several years. We've been, we shot Cuckoo in Germany to take advantage of soft monies. I know this is what the next program is about, but like, you know, we're, we're shooting uh, Charlie Kaufman's next film, and it takes place in New York City, and we're going to either shoot it in Serbia or Poland, probably. I don't, you know, it's, it's the difference is one-fourth of what it would cost to shoot in New York City right now. So I know we have uh, another deal coming up the pipeline that could raise our costs even more. So well, we'll see what happens. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying about like pre-sale, the old classic cliche of there's uh, 10 names that will sell internationally, even though that people say, oh, that's no longer the case, it seems it's still exactly the case. I was talking to a seller who was like saying, oh yeah, we're going to new names or whatever, and the projects he was talking about were a Jared Butler project, a, a Jason Statham project, and a Nicolas Cage project, so uh, yeah. Well, we, we have one of the Nicolas Cage projects. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I think it really depends on budget level. So if you're looking at the sub five range, um, if you partner with the right international sales agents, they're selling the director and they're selling the vision of what the film is as much as they are um, looking at actors and saying, this ticks the box. And I think that's happening more. Even if you look at the films that are succeeding um, in the US box office in the specialty market, it's not predicated on those names. And I think internationally with box offices, you know, in certain territories going up again, you know, it's not as reliant. And would you agree, though, in the sub $5 million space, that is a place where there are equity film, uh, financiers still around that'll put in a million? Uh, I've, been, you know. I've been told. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've been told, too. <laughs> um, uh, can I ask, I mean, you mentioned Cuckoo, which uh, shot in Germany, but it was also a proper co-production, right? Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, that seems to be an obvious method to use for certain types of mid-budget films. Soft money structures in Europe are ideal for those type of budgets. Um, using an English language or an international or American cast can make it, you know, boost the appeal internationally and so forth. They don't happen that often. Um, why is that? Is, what, is, what are the particular challenges to making those models work together, the US and, and, and European? Because it would seem an ideal situation. Take soft money out of Europe, take US talent, and make movies that you know, the international audience wants to see. It's, it's happening, but it's like definitely growing pains. Uh, some of the, the pure, because there's a lot of films in Europe that are made purely from grants and tax credits and soft monies and that system is sometimes incompatible with an equity financier. It, it's, it can be done but it takes like a lot of, of, of work to get it there and I think to uh, an issue is that you know for us to lock a finance plan from the equity side we need to know how much the gap is, how much of the soft money is going to be contributing. And on the flip side they're like well we're not going to tell you how much if it's going to be until you tell us what the budget is. And it's like well it's just a catch-22. So, you know, there are some companies, uh, you know, I know like Agoschein in Germany who are like now saying, oh, we'll, we'll front how much we are going to get out of Germany. And like for us, that's like, okay, great. Now we can like really pick on something. So yeah, I think it is happening. It's going to continue happening as the price of shooting in the U.S. increases. And I think my biggest complaint is that the U.S. doesn't do anything about combating the rise of uh, uh, labor and which needs to happen because we don't pay people uh, enough and also um, just inflation and every year I feel like I'm seeing all over the world more and more 
aggressive legislation being introduced on a yearly basis from European uh, countries and around the world to make it more attractive to go there. So, I think, I mean, of our equity investments, not a, I wouldn't call it equity investments, but our partnerships with European sales agents to help uh, European producers finalize their budgets, I think of the narratives we're doing, the majority are European constructed, so it's not just using Europe as a location and using kind of the discrepancies, and, but it is working alongside, you know, long-standing companies who make the types of movies we want to make. And it is, you know, it, from a cultural perspective, there are rules that you've got to follow, and those rules, you know, if you want to be involved in European cinema, are specific. And a lot of American investors, I don't think we're necessarily incentivized in the last 20 years to, to involve themselves in that, from copyright control to um, how much equity, or not equity, but how much money can go in from outside of Europe. So it's pretty specific, so it also means you're, in, you're working on specific types of films. Um, it's not necessarily creating a development slate, it's more look, looking at opportunity. Yeah, I mean, well, I was going to say, I'd love to get your perspective on Orwell, which is a project that <laughs> we're doing together, which we took pre-sales on, and sort of, you know, what was the experience after we came in on that? Uh, we're producing the film, which is good, uh, <laughs> and That's it will be finished, I promise, uh, <laughs> at some point too. Raul's very excited about it. That's a bit of a different question, because the document, do documentary markets change so much. Um, from an investment standpoint. In our first year, when I left UTA and uh, joined Anonymous, we were taking big swings with Alex Gibney, with you know, folks like that, you know, big swings in terms of what nonfiction investments were. And the territory by territory market for um, documentaries is significantly less than trying to do all rights deals. Um, you may disagree with me on this, but I think the theatrical market for documentaries is in Peril right now to a certain degree, which is unfortunate, and I think a lot of that is viewing habits. We've gotten so used to it, but I, the optimist in me sees a swing, you know, in terms of the stuff on that's being made by a lot of the streamers just isn't that enticing. The more aggressive things that they make um, tends to be the stuff that gets watched more, and I think again with younger markets, you know, kind of going out, hopefully it'll pop up. But the international territory by territory for docs is tough. Yeah, um, and I bring that one up because I do think that's like a great big swing. That's uh, that's like a great nonfiction project in my mind that can work in theaters, and obviously that's why we came in on it. Um, and it is down right now, which um, you know is it's it disappoints me ultimately. But here's a great auteur filmmaker. Here's a really exciting subject in George Orwell, Raoul Peck coming together and bringing this to cinemas. Hopefully, will create a path that you know people see that it's still viable. That 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 people really still want to come out for quality projects, curated projects, campaigns that we really that we really put ourselves behind. Because I think that's what is missing in a lot of ways right now, certainly from the doc space. It just doesn't feel like these projects are being made right now. And even from the fiction space, um, yeah, I just, I, it, it, what's working is really, I mean, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer, but really original stories um, and actually things that are hitting the fringe, like with di in the U.S., you know, diverse cast, Boy and the Heron did amazing um, things that you know women feel like they want to come out for, um, black audiences want to come out for. So these are the kind of stories, and honestly, in a lot of ways, they're mid-budget titles, and they're really working in the U.S. So I would like to see a an international film, and I'm I'm, I'm hoping that some of the work that Neon is doing is, is making audiences and other companies recognize that international film is really viable for audiences. These are some of the best stories that we've got in theaters. Anatomy of a Fall, Perfect Days. These were really big successes for us in the US and they're really incredible stories that aren't being told and made in the US and that's another great part of our business. We're almost out of time. That would be actually a great place to stop. But I would like to ask all of you, uh, just looking for just a couple of years, because things move so quickly uh, in the industry at the moment, what do you see either as um, 
the biggest challenge uh, in the next one or two years in packaging, financing films, um, or the biggest opportunity you see with the shift uh, that's happened in the market, either, either challenge or, uh, or opportunity? Uh, I'll go happy and sad or yeah. <laughs> terrified and optimistic. Um, the terrifying thing to me is keeping theaters open and seeing if we can expand past the core kind of 60 theaters that work in the art house um, and what the implications are. And this is more macro, what happens if in Detroit, where I'm from, it takes you 35 minutes to find a, any type of movie theater to go to. So outside the core cities, like, how do we keep that going? Uh, the optimist, happy uh, side of me, which is you know, pretty prevalent, is I like the idea that in the next four years, my daughter, who's 17, is just going to continue to go to cinema. You know? And I think if we can continue to, you know, with the help of the neons of the world, um, propel kids to enjoy that as a social experience, you know, hopefully that can ameliorate some of the terror that exists. So. I, would, I would definitely agree with a lot of that, because I think, too, the younger generations, it seems like, are just feeling like they're not getting content made for them, and there's so many other ways to be entertained today that there haven't been in the past. And, you know, I agree going, I grew up in Phoenix and like we had one specialty theater and there's still just one specialty theater really uh, for like the fifth largest city in the country. So, you know, I, I hope that we can keep that going. And I think the optimist in me, you know, and the, the real reason we made this slate deal to go and make, you know, these a $25 million film that is a forgotten, you know, special wide release film that is original, um, but it's made on a for a, a conscious budget because um, you know there's there's all these tent poles that are getting made for inflated costs because of the rising cost of a plus talent and they just can't recoup um, and if we can do original stories with proper scope and have an innovative marketing machine and release machine like neon you know I think uh, I, I hope we can fill this this void that is certainly in the marketplace because it's either feels like it's either sub five or a hundred million dollar like temple that feels like it's been neutered down by a billion creative executives. Yeah. All right, that's it. It's a, yeah, no, it's good. And, uh, at least you all same. What do you see either as the ma major challenge or the greatest opportunity for the shifts that's happening in the in business at the moment? Um, well, I'm just going to go all optimism. Uh, <laughs> um, so. It's been really optimistic to see that specialty film has bounced back um, more so than commercial film, than, than you know, the, the other parts of the box office. Uh, additionally, that younger folks are coming out and becoming our new art house audience. And the other thing that I've seen is really promising, Nick, and this will make you happy, is that exhibitors are trying really, really hard. This has made exhibitors and movie theaters work harder than they've ever worked before, and they're excited about it. And they're really interested in engaging their audiences, trying new things, listening to distribution and working with us really closely for the first time ever. It feels really good. So um, it's really funny because I come from a really small town that has three art house theaters. Um, so um, I, I have faith. Oh, that's great. That's great. Great to hear. Well, please, a uh, round of applause for our, uh, our panel. And I'll be moving on very quickly. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.